Before we get to the news, quick housekeeping item. Uh, Vote Save America has a new ballot tool. It's live. You can use it in all 50 states. If you go to votesaveamerica.com slash ballot, you enter your address where you're registered to vote. You can see all the races in your area, all the ballot measures they'll be voting on and get information about all of them. So that way, you know, not just who's at the top of the ticket, but you can be you know, confident that you've done the research you need to vote in all the down ballot races because those are so important. Our team did so much research. They compiled all this information. They made it so easy for you to learn about the things that are on your ballot and to make informed choices and just be like prepared when you go into your your voting booth or you fill out your vote by mail. So check it out. VoteSaveAmerica.com. Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. To learn more. I'm Ben Rhodes. Ben, uh, what are we, three weeks out? Three weeks out. How's your anxiety? Uh, I mean, they, like I'm at the stage now where I'm anxious because I'm not anxious, mm-hmm. which is, I guess, not a bad place to be. Yeah, I'm constantly finding myself mad at myself for not being more wigged out. But then you look at the polls and then I think about 2016 and I go into like a shame spiral. I'm yeah, kind yeah. of out of it today. But then like you or Favreau or somebody sends some text about like a bad result in Arizona and I just spiral all over again. Somebody is always, I mean, uh, you, people, the world has heard us reference this text chain where I have with Favreau and Dan Pfeiffer and the great Cody Keenan. Someone is always dark um, on any given day. So I think that keeps me grounded. Yeah, it's uh, unnerving. Well, anyway, we got some fun light subjects for you guys today. Uh, we got some updates on our troop presence in Afghanistan. Questions, concerns about the president of the United States, unchecked nuclear authorities, I'll say. Mm. Uh the K-pop group BTS is in a little trouble, Ben. There's questions about reporting on terrorism at the New York Times. We'll also talk about refugees, uh, corruption in Angola, news from Facebook, Belarus, uh, marijuana in Mexico, and then some brave bionic turtle eggs. Uh, all right, let's start talking about Afghanistan for a little bit. So on Sunday, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, did an interview with NPR that covered a bunch of ground. So he talked about how he was spending time in quarantine after coming in contact with a colleague who had covid Good news there is it sounds like DOD is taking things a lot more seriously uh, than the White House and the Senate that is currently holding a closed room hearing with a bunch of sick people. With, and it's crazy. Uh, but the big news out of the interview was General Milley's comments about troop levels in Afghanistan. So last week, Robert O'Brien, Trump's national security advisor, said that troop levels will be down to 2,500 by early next year. That's in Afghanistan. Trump later contradicted O'Brien on Twitter by saying all troops will be home from Afghanistan by Christmas. In this interview, Milley basically says, you're both wrong. Uh, the U.S. is now at 4,500 troops in Afghanistan, and future drawdowns will be conditions-based. Uh, Milley also was asked about you know, sort of the conditions themselves, and he admitted that violence hasn't materially decreased in the past four or five months, which suggests to me that the conditions for withdrawal are not met in his mind, and thus the drawdown won't be completed. He was also sort of unrelatedly asked what the military would do in the event of a disputed election. Milley said he believes there's no role for the U.S. military in that, kind of chilling that he had to clarify. Uh, he was also asked about domestic extremism in the U.S. military and dismissed it as sort of not really an issue, which I didn't think was that great of an answer since two of the guys arrested in the plot to kidnap Michigan Gover- Governor Gretchen Whitmer served in the Marine Corps. Uh, but interesting overall interview. Ben, uh, there was something... I don't know, comforting and familiar to me about a top Pentagon official ignoring a presidential order about a uh, troop withdrawal time frame. That's just a joke, listeners. But any big takeaways for you from this interview? Well, I think, uh, you know, first of all, it, it reinforces what's been the case throughout the Trump presidency, which is that there are two policies when it comes to the wars. There's Trump talking about ending the wars, and then there's the actual policy of the United States government, which has been to increase troops in Afghanistan and then reduce them to where they were uh, at the end of the Obama years. And what's so absurd about this is, you know, Trump clearly tweeted that all the troops would be home before Christmas without telling the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, without notifying any of the troops in Afghanistan. And he did so in the middle of very sensitive negotiations between the Afghan government and the Taliban, in which the U.S. saying that they're going to remove all the troops by Christmas just tells the Taliban, well, you're going to get everything you want. Uh, And I think that's probably 
the main outcome of that tweet was to secure the endorsement of the Taliban, which Donald Trump has secured now. Which he uh, did do. A, a coveted endorsement from the from the Taliban. So he managed with a single tweet to piss off his military, to undermine the Afghan government in peace talks, and to confuse everybody. A tweet is not an order. And why did he do it? He obviously did it because he wants an election eve talking point that he's taking the troops out of Afghanistan. But that's so odd to me, Tommy, because I don't think any person is going to vote for Donald Trump because of that tweet. You know, no. like it's not like this whole election is swinging on the remaining several thousand troops in Afghanistan and the pace of their departure. So he put all this at risk for just what, like to, to have a, a, a good tweet, you know, that could give him something to say at a rally. It's it's an uh, insane it, way to make policy in a war. Imagine for a second that your your husband or your wife or your, your son or, or your mother is serving in Afghanistan and the president of the United States tweets that they will be home by Christmas. You you believe that. You want that to yeah, happen. Yeah, and it's clearly yeah. just was just bullshit posturing. It's it's just so it's so callous towards the people who are actually doing the real sacrificing here. Yeah, the, the the troops that we have there, the Afghans who are suffering there, who aren't certain about the future. The, the, and the other takeaways I had, you mentioned the violence. It, again, it reinforces what we've talked about, which is this deal that they made with the Taliban got nothing. I mean, so they gave away all this leverage and making a deal to the Taliban instead of with the Afghan government first and got nothing for it, you know, and... And, and here we are with like nobody knows what the Afghan policy is four years into the administration, you know, and yeah. I, I, too, looked at the answers on on extremism and white supremacy in the military with some disappointment because he was pretty nonchalant about it. I mean, to be positive, he did indicate that they look for things like tattoos and behavior. It did seem like they had protocols to, to track this stuff. So I th thought that was a welcome uh, shift. But I think it, it, you know, it does raise the question of if you have a Biden administration and we're looking comprehensively at the threat of white supremacist violence and terrorism, um, is there is there any more that needs to be done here? Given in part, like you said, the, the fact that two of these people who were radicalized and engaged in a plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan uh, had served in the, in the Marine Corps. It's just something that, that, that I'd like to see them, you know, uh, uh, there were signs they're taking seriously. I don't want to suggest they're not, but that, that they, they, they truly grasp the scale of the problem in our entire society, right? And our society includes the military. It's not to single them out. It's to say that, that everybody's going to have to be mindful of this threat. We don't have to single them out, but like, I'm so fucking sick of everyone dancing around data that suggests that there is active recruiting from white supremacist groups of U.S. military members, in part because they have the training necessary that yeah. these militias want. Right. Like we got you, you and I were part of the White House that got basically browbeaten into having to disavow a uh, Department of Homeland Security report that that made this sort of obvious point because the politics of it was seen as somehow attacking U.S. service members when really it was just like hiding their, their heads in the sand from the problem. It was a mistake, in my opinion. Yeah, we, we have to acknowledge facts here, you know, and, and yeah, like there's fact patterns where obviously they would want to recruit from the U.S. military or from the veteran community because of people's knowledge of weapons. But then you see things like that insane uh, trial of a, of a Navy SEAL, you know, who, who, whose, whose own men had reported him for war crimes, you know, for for, you know, killing a, a, a young ISIS fighter for, you know, defaming corpses. Um, if, if you didn't see warning signs in that whole saga and Trump, of course, stepped in to, you know, pardon that guy. And now that guy's like a surrogate for Trump. Um, if you don't see warning signs and stuff like that, like then you're not paying attention to yeah. to the radicalization that's happening in different corners of American society un under the Trump presidency. Speaking of radicalization, we weren't kidding about the Taliban endorsement. Uh, the, a Taliban spokesman told CBS News, quote, we hope he, Trump, will win the election and wind up U.S. military presence in Afghanistan. This comes about a month after Osama bin Laden's niece uh, hopped on the MAGA train and said that only Trump can prevent another 9-11. Biden better get his shit together and start courting some of these folks before all the good uh, <laughs> extremist endorsements are gone. On this troop level thing, this is a related but I think important story. So in, t in December of 2017, 
the administration decided to stop releasing basic information about troop deployments in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, like basic, basic stuff, like how many troops are deployed in each country. For decades, under Republicans, Democrats, both administrations, this information was released several times a year in what are called quarterly manpower reports. Um, since 2017, the troop level figures in these reports have been redacted. So last week, an organization called Just Security actually sued the US government for them. Ben, I guess I didn't realize that DOD had completely stopped providing that information. I assume I know the answer to this, but is there any rationale for classifying no. or refusing to release those figures? There's absolutely none. And, you know, these were, I remember late in the Obama administration, we would, you know, we would make very incremental increases in the number of troops fighting ISIS in Iraq and Syria, you know, so we, you know, a couple of hundred or 300. And we'd report that to Congress. It was just part of the requirement. Um, and this is an across the board shift away from transparency too, Tommy. They rescinded some executive orders from the Obama administration about the release of civilian casualty numbers. Yep. So we suddenly don't know the civilian casualties in U.S. counterterrorism operations and drone strikes. There, there's been a, a shroud of secrecy placed around all of our military deployments. And again, it gets back to what I was saying, that Trump likes to talk about ending wars, and he's done the opposite. He's increased the number of troops serving in the Middle East by almost 20,000. He had an Afghan surge early in his presidency. The counter-ISIS uh, campaign continues in, in part because the operations had to stop because of the threat to our forces after the Qasem Soleimani assassination. But those troops are still in Iraq. They're just there under greater risk from Iranian backed militias. Um, and the the pace of drone strikes, by all accounts, has increased significantly. There are places like Somalia that have seen huge increases in, in reported U.S. drone strikes. But we just don't know anything about this. Yeah. And, and so it seems to be designed so that the military can do whatever they want without having to be accountable to things like civilian casualties. And Trump can go out and tell everybody that he's ending the wars. There was like a whole thematic day at the Republican convention about how he's he's ending these wars. And, and, and he's not, but he's he's preventing the American people from even knowing what troops we have, that th these are our you know sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, our tax dollars, and, and we have no visibility into it. There's no reason for this. Yeah, I mean, look, the, that data you just tick through is sort of why I get so frustrated at the press when I see them call him more transparent because he like does these brief press avails where he screams over like a helicopter yeah. motor or whatever, like it just lies. Like that's not transparency, that is engaging with the press and telling a bunch of lies. Um, different issue, also Trump related. So the Trump, you know, he just went through this COVID fight. He, he had a very public discussion of his use of a combination of untested and powerful drugs with side effects that include delusion and mania. And, and that conversation, that reality is kicked up a long overdue discussion about how and when the U.S. can use nuclear weapons. So David Sanger and Bill Broad at The New York Times had a great piece on this on Sunday. The, the frightening context, just for listeners to know, is that any president, including Donald Trump, they have the sole authority and power to launch nuclear weapons. No one else in government has to sign off. There's no way for the cabinet or staff to stop you short of resigning or basically like staging an internal insurrection. Um, and so holding the nuclear codes is this grave, gravest responsibility that any president has. And Trump has been pretty cavalier about it in the past, right? August 2017, he threatened to use fire and fury against North Korea. That comment was clearly about threatening nuclear war. So there's really two pieces of this current debate. The first is whether Trump should have temporarily given the authority to Mike Pence when he was in the hospital. That's one piece of it. But the bigger issue is whether the U.S. should update our system to include more safeguards. Most other countries, including Russia, which requires uh, a sign off from two out of three designated officials to launch a nuclear weapon, they don't put all of that power in one person's hands. And this piece notes that it's almost you, the, the presidential role is unique in our own internal system because at every other step before you get to the presidency, there is there is redundancy and extreme vetting built into the process to the point where you need two authorized people in a nuclear silo or a sub to take any step to arm and launch a nuke. So. Ben, you know, we talked a lot about nuclear weapons policy in the Obama administration. Um, do you remember like conversations about the process about how the president would actually launch a nuclear weapon? And did you guys ever debate adding some like safeguards to this final stage so that you couldn't, you know, you could prevent like a, a madman president from just doing something? Yeah. I don't know that incinerates the earth. 
We didn't. You know, our our debates about nuclear policy, you know, tended to be more about, for instance, should the United States declare that we won't use nuclear weapons first? Uh, it's called the so-called no first use policy, that, that the only scenario in which we would use nuclear weapons is if we were attacked, which I think was a common sense <laughs> change to make. But we actually didn't yeah. get that change through because there's a lot of resistance from the Pentagon, from the Department of Energy, from state. Um, we, we did move in the direction of saying that the sole purpose of nuclear weapons is to deter uh, an attack. But I'll come back to this. In the Trump era, since Trump was elected, there's been a lot of movement in Congress to advance legislation that requires some additional sign off in the chain of command so that this isn't just on the, the president's desk or, you know, or the, the, the head of the president who may be mentally unfit for office or may be incapacitated with an illness. And I, you know, I'm, in, I'm on the board of an organization called Plowshares that's done a lot of work on this. And, and there's actually a book out now called The Button um, by former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry that deals with mm-hmm. this issue. I think it makes complete sense. Trump is the, the example as to what you don't want, which is a president who may be mentally unfit, mentally unstable, um, using nuclear weapons and wanting to make sure that there's somebody else in the chain of command that has to sign off on this. If not, more in, under more extreme circumstances or proposals, some, some congressional notification of this. Um, but I, I think this shouldn't go away with Trump. I think we've learned a lesson with Trump as president about how dangerous it is for the United States to put all of this power in the hands of one human being. And that's kind of such a Cold War artifact because the Cold War, yeah, you know, we, 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 the nuclear scenarios that we imagined were, you know, the Soviets launch a massive first strike at the U.S. and the president has to authorize a response right away. And, and the entire apparatus, the nuclear football, you know, was designed for that. That's not the likely scenario of how these decisions might even emerge in a post-Cold War environment in any case. So I think you can you can argue that the circumstances have changed. I'll tell you, Tommy, I used to ride Control, you'll call, recall is the name of the vehicle in the President's Motorcade. Um, and and I, I rode with the military aide who had that briefcase. It was a nuclear football. And it was always a very strange feeling to look down and see this suitcase that, you know, hey. you know, would allow one human being in a moment's notice to destroy life on Earth. You know, let's add another layer here. So I, when Biden comes in, what they'll do is this what's called a nuclear posture review when they look at all of the nuclear weapons related policies to the U.S., and it's an opportunity, I think, both to get behind some of the legislative proposals that have emerged for taking away sole authority from the president of the United States, and also to look at these questions like, should we declare that we will not use nuclear weapons in a first strike, which I think we should. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, okay, let's talk about China for a little bit, uh, because they are once again going after private citizens and corporations in response to you know basically perceived cultural or, or historical slights. And this time, the target is the K-pop band uh, BTS. And in case you are not a BTS fan, they are arguably, you know, some of the most famous human beings on the planet. Last year, they sold out the 52,000-seat Rose Bowl. Uh, in 2018, they sold out the Staples Center four nights in a row. Ben, I was reading this LA Times article. They cited a study by a South Korean consulting firm that found BTS alone was worth $3.6 billion to the South Korean economy, and that one in every 13 tourists visiting South Korea in 2017 cited BTS as a reason for their trip. So the point here is they have some clout. Yeah, that gets us to this story, which is that there was a recent ceremony commemorating uh, the Korean War and a member of BTS named RM talked at it. And he, and he talked about the shared sacrifice between American and Korean South Koreans who died during the war. So an estimated 200,000 South Korean soldiers died, uh, along with millions of civilians and roughly 37,000 U.S. soldiers. It was an absolutely horrible war that we don't talk about enough. But people on Chinese social media platforms got angry that he didn't also mention the sacrifice of Chinese soldiers who fought on the North Korean side. Now, if you're a little confused by this story and wondering why <laughs> folks yeah. in China would want the, the South Koreans who are fighting against the Chinese to recognize all their sacrifice, I- I'm with you. Regardless, there was a bunch of blow, blowback instantly, right? So Samsung, Fila, Hyundai, they all have partnerships with BTS. They quickly scrubbed any mentions of BTS from their Chinese websites and their social media feeds. Um, By the way, a lot of this background comes from uh, a New York Times report that also speculated that these brands were scrubbing the BTS mentions to avoid a boycott. Uh, Chinese deputy, China's deputy foreign minister also commented that he had basically, he's like, I saw the comments. He sort of noted the reaction online. Uh, A bunch of nationalistic Chinese publications made a big deal of it. 
Um, you know, this sounded a lot like the Daryl Morey Houston Rockets situation where this this GM for an NBA team shared a total totally banal uh, image about Hong Kong. And, you know, there was this manufactured outrage. I can't tell if this outrage is manufactured or not, but it feels similar. It's also just part of a pattern, right? So China is trying to curtail free speech about issues like Tibet and Hong Kong and the boundaries of the South China Sea. And they're seemingly trying to send a message, I think, by going after like the biggest targets they can find. Disney, the NBA, ESPN, BTS, right? And like the scary thing is it seems to work. So I, I don't know, Ben, did I miss any background here on why <laughs> China would demand a South Korean pop star uh, acknowledge their sacrifice in the Korean War. And then, like, again, if, if China can try and silence these huge organizations, like, is anyone immune? Like, is this just how it is now, do you think? Yeah, I, I think there, there are two pieces that highlight, and it's such an important story, actually, even though it seems less important if you're not a BTS stan. Um, you know, first of all, the Chinese government moved in the direction of promoting this kind of virulent Chinese nationalism increasingly in the 21st century when they stopped being so communist. <laughs> you know, so, so you had to have this answer to the question of why are we governed by a one-party communist party mm -hmm. in a system that isn't really communist anymore? And they've kind of reinvented themselves as a nationalist party. And, and to, to stoke that nationalism, they really dialed up the historical grievances, you know, the anti-Japanese grievances over World War II, the grievances against the West for dividing China and history, <clears throat> And, and, and so they've created this snowball of Chinese nationalism that you're right, like whether this was government trolls and there are a lot of Chinese trolls who get things moving on social media yeah. or whether this was the, the, the people themselves. This is a Pandora's box that was opened by the Chinese government. And I've heard this from a lot of people like in Hong Kong, as world does know, I spent a bunch of time there. And someone told me that, that they knew that the that things had really changed with respect to Chinese nationalism in the 2008 Olympics a Hong Kong pop star, like one of the biggest pop stars, tweeted something uh, or said something in social media about Hong Kong athletes instead of Chinese athletes. And they basically got destroyed on social media in China. And there was a boycott and their career suffered mightily. Right. And Man. so this has been a tool that they've used. And, and the second point I make is that Yes, they're weighing in on something that seems absurd, like BTS not commenting on Chinese sacrifices in a war against South Korea. But it's a warning shot to keep the BTSs of the world from saying anything more substantive about Chinese policy, right? So if you're constantly brushing back the NBA, Disney, BTS on these seemingly you know, obscure or anodyne controversies, you're sending a bigger message, which is you better not say anything about Tibet or the Uyghurs or right. anything that is a, right. a serious concern to us because it's like deterrence. We're going to whack you in the face just for saying anything that isn't completely in line with our, our view. And I think it's, it's eroding free expression in our countries because you clearly see companies self-censoring, Disney self-censoring in their movies, the NBA self-censoring in the, the, the comments that players make, even if the NBA says, and they have said the right things about free speech, you know, clearly these players don't want to risk the Chinese market. And so they yeah. don't say much about it. And, and I think there has to be a concerted effort. And there's, there's legislation in Congress that is meant to uh, compel U.S. companies, at least, to not put any restrictions on the free speech of their employees. I think that's not a bad idea. Like, we have to start making it clear that we're not just going to let China control it's bad enough that they try to control what their own people say and do. The, the, the idea that they're going to control what, what BTS or the NBA says and does, it, it runs totally counter to the idea of an open society. That's a really interesting idea. I like that, uh, that idea from Congress. Um, let's turn to the New York Times itself for a minute, because there's been some controversy lately about their coverage of terrorism. So if you've read a story in the Times about ISIS or terrorism, you probably read a piece by a, a journalist named Rukmini Kalamaki. And, and full disclosure, I'm a fan of her work. I've promoted it a million times. I've tried to book her on this show countless times, what was said, you know, ignored or blown off by the New York Times PR people. And look, in fairness to her, like the New York Times has barred its reporters from doing any crooked shows unless they're promoting a book. Uh, so it's probably not her fault. Regardless, like the accuracy of her reporting uh, has been called into question a couple times. So you may have heard the podcast Caliphate 
it was about ISIS. The series was basically entirely based on, on the account of one Canadian man who claimed to have been in ISIS and done these truly horrible, like graphic things. Well, it turns out he made it all up. Uh, last month, he was actually arrested under a, a Canadian law that prevents that. Uh, pre previously, she had reported on some ISIS documents that now uh, appear to be fake in some instances. Uh, her colleagues at the Times had raised ethical concerns about a story she wrote uh, about the four U.S. soldiers who were killed in Niger a couple of years ago. These the paper actually purchased video uh, of their deaths from a media organization linked to Al Qaeda. Uh, which is unethical for a variety of reasons. And then there was a, a 2014 article that claimed the U.S. government had basically ignored information that could have led to the rescue uh, of American hostages in Syria. And that piece appears to have been wrong as well. And so there's a couple more incidents like this. I, I don't raise these things to like pick on her. I don't know all the details of what happened. And my, by no means am I suggesting that it's easy to, to write about these subjects. But first, like I've mentioned her reporting enough uh, to feel like, you know, giving you guys this context is important. But then second, what pisses me off about this incident, Ben, is not like the possibility that she might have made mistakes. It's that the New York Times is like just so reflexively defensive about it, right? Yeah. Like they're yeah. going to review the reporting that went into caliphate. But more often than not, they just circle the wagons and they defend the fucking reporting like a flack would uh, for a politician. Yeah. And like, yeah. yes, I am bitter about all the like Hillary emails stuff right and we're right before the election it's all coming dredging back up but like where is the introspection where, where is the transparency where are the consequences for making these mistakes because like the press corps wouldn't accept this response or approach from the government right like yeah. i don't yeah. know end of speech but do you remember this story in 2014 ben about hostages in syria did that impact policy discussions? Well, you know, yeah. First of all, uh, I didn't know that cricket rule, by the way. That's interesting. I, I did yeah. a quick quick plug. I had uh, Austin Ramsey, the Hong Kong bureau chief on Missing America. They, they might not have known it was a cricket pod. See? Um, uh, and he was super it. interesting. So listen yeah. to episode three of Missing America. But um, yeah, I, so first of all, that, that story contributed to the broader narrative that this operation that we did launch to rescue the hostages was slow was you know uh, could have been done better and by the way you still see mike pence in the debate you know hitting that that's and it, it's entirely not true uh, barack obama made the decision to to launch a very complicated special operation into syria like within a day i think of when he was presented that option mike pence says it's a month you know and part of this is is this narrative that dates all the way back to that story um, not just that story, but you know some other reporting. But I, I don't want to sound sour grapes on that. I, where I'm going to sound more sour grapes is, you know, the New York Times, despite being you know uh, the preeminent newspaper in the world and despite having tremendous foreign correspondence, has repeatedly succumbed to the kind of hyperbolic, fear-driven coverage of terrorism that has sustained the quote unquote war on terror now for 20 years. Um, they hyped the uh, threat from Iraq's weapons of mass destruction and never really did sufficient introspection about that. And I'm not suggesting ISIS wasn't a threat, but a lot of these stories were about scaring people, were about, you know, yep. this is, is even worse than it appears to be. And these, you know, we're going to tell you these people who were radicalized and this guy who's back in Canada is going to paint this scary picture of the caliphate. It's not to suggest that none of the reporting is true, but it is to suggest that all these errors seem to be on the hype, the threat um, side of the equation, you know? And, and so to me, there's the question of why the New York Times, which is supposed to be about facts and putting things into context, you know, has consistently kind of privileged, prioritized, defended reporting that has turned out in retrospect to hype threats and particularly to hype threats relative to, to other things like you know climate change and pandemics maybe that didn't get anywhere near the attention of the pages of the times so that 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 that's a bigger issue about just the terrorism reporting in this country and in our media but the new york times sets the tone in ways i i think it's important for world those to understand you know because tommy and i had to sit in the white house communications a new york times story sets the agenda for everybody else the truth is most of these other big news organizations don't have a lot of reporting capacity anymore. You know, they've closed down farm bureaus. So what do they do? They wake up in Washington and they read the New York Times <laughs> and they basically take their cues from the Times. A big New York Times story 
particularly in a non-Trump era where Trump isn't orchestrating right. the news media, a big New York Times story can drive the conversation for weeks, if not months, right? And, and she had written some of those types of stories. And you, I'm glad you made the point you did because, you know, the Times insists on, rightly, accountability from people in power, you know, that we need to be self-reflective, that we need to acknowledge error, that we need to be transparent about our mistakes and not just our successes. And the New York Times does the opposite. And people should read this Ben Smith story in the Times that deconstructs this, because at every turn, there was this kind of circle the wagons, defend her, defend her reporting at all costs approach. Even after this guy in Canada was arrested for fabricating it, their first instinct was still to defend the podcast and say, well, actually, she said that, you know, there might be doubts about his story. She only said that at the end of this multi-part podcast series that was entirely rooted in believing what he had said. You know, so they, they just have this reflexive defensiveness that, to your point, they would never accept that from government flax. But their top editors at the paper do it over and over again. And, and people might get a little confused on Twitter. Why are there all these New York Times controversies? Because this really matters. It really is kind of the paper of record. And if they can't acknowledge error and they don't learn from their mistakes, they repeat them. And we saw that with the Rock WMD reporting. We saw that with Hillary's emails and the reporting on that and the obsession on it. They, they need to have some capacity to reflect and improve what is already, you know, arguably the best newspaper in the world, but could be better. Yeah, look, I, I, I'm a subscriber. I love the New York Times. I know a love lot it. Of the love the Times personally. Yeah. I think their their international coverage is critical to my understanding of the world. It's critical yeah. to the production of this show. Uh, but like, they got rid of their public editor, you know, and they, that was a really weird step in the wrong direction for a, a major modern media publication. And then. Just zooming back from the New York Times to the broader point you made, which I, I'm so glad you did, which is just like this like fear porn around terrorism. Like here's yeah. here's here's who's the victim of that narrative and that coverage: refugees. Okay, so the yeah. Trump administration informed Congress this week that they intend to admit a maximum of 15,000 refugees into the U.S. in 2021. These announcements are always paired with some Mike Pompeo statement that says things like, "The U.S. is the most generous nation in the world." Fuck you, Mike. Get out of here. Yeah. Like that. So that is below the 18,000 person cap that the administration set for 2020, even though they only let in 11,000 refugees. And so the AP report on this noted that this official announcement came right after a vile racist speech Trump gave in Minnesota, where he targeted Ilhan Omar, a congressman Ilhan Omar, and claimed that Biden will turn Minnesota into a refugee camp. And so the White House has also, I think, proposed not admitting refugees from Somalia, Syria, or Yemen, countries that we've helped bomb the shit out of over the last couple of decades, right? And again, like I, Obama is responsible for a lot of that. And so uh, the other thing that was weird, Ben, is that the State Department is refusing to provide basic data on refugee resettlement. So again, I guess cutting off access to basic data is like a theme for today. Uh, just for context for people, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees puts the global number of people who have been displaced because they're fleeing violence or, or political persecution is 71 million. So 71 million people are displaced. I think 26 million of them are officially refugees. Um, for more context, Obama approved allowing 110,000 refugees into the U.S. in 2016. Biden said he would reset the refugee cap at 125,000 if he's elected. Uh, when Trump first started demagoguing this issue, again, like ISIS was seen as ascendant, refugee flows into Europe were a huge news story. He tried this shit again with like the caravan nonsense in 2018. It didn't work politically. So I guess here's my question. Historically, immigrants, refugees, they get blamed for all kinds of problems. So I don't want to be naive about this and say it'll be better. But do you have hope that Biden can reframe this debate about refugees and like bring it back to a values argument? Or, I mean, are you as worried as I am that like, Fox News is just going to like lead the charge on all the same terrorist fear mongering. Yeah, well, again, good Missing America plug here. Yeah, episode seven, episode we do this. refugees. And then um, Jake Sullivan and I talk about a Biden policy for refugees in the last yep. episode, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. I mean, I do want to just make, make the point. It, it needs to be repeated. Like refugees have not committed acts of terrorism in, in any you know, in any scale whatsoever, um, despite all the fear mongering about this, they go through a process of vetting that that goes beyond normal immigration vetting. And they're people that generally have been 
enormous contributors to American society precisely because they're so grateful to be here because they've had to leave such horrendous circumstances. If you're a refugee, by definition, legally, you are fleeing an intolerable situation, right? In, in America, has, you know, Holocaust survivors, the lost boys of Sudan, uh, the Vietnamese boat people who've become incredibly successful uh, populations here in the U.S. Like we have been enriched by refugees. We have a, a double responsibility here. A lot of the refugees are tied to the war on terror and, and the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq. You mentioned Yemen, Somalia. These are places where the United States has been engaged militarily in contributing to the dynamic that has led to the refugee flows. So we have a moral responsibility here. And the other piece is it's not just that we go down to, you know, from 110,000 at the end of Obama to, to almost zero under Trump. It's that that is just a, a blinking green light carte blanche for other governments to not taking refugees. And you've seen European countries taking less refugees. You've seen European countries taking less refugees. You've seen conditions worsen in, in places like Greece along the periphery where refugees are reaching Europe. So there's a knock on effect when we're not doing our part, then nobody else does. Whereas when we do our part, we can get other nations to take in refugees because we have more credibility on the issue, or we can help design processes and fund mechanisms to take care of refugees and, and to, to place them in, in, in different countries. So the whole system is kind of creak, was creaky to begin with, obviously, before Trump, and it's, it's now kind of unraveling to some extent. Biden has said a, a lot of the right things about this. He is committed uh, to taking in even more refugees than we did at the end of the Obama administration to go up to 125,000 um, and, and, and to trying to re-energize the global infrastructure around refugees, as well as obviously rescinding the Muslim ban on day one and restoring the asylum process, right, where people can apply for asylum status in the United States. Trump has done away with that, too. So actually, this is an issue where Biden has been really good. Um, and, and he's got, I mean, I know the people who work on this stuff for him, they're the right kind of people. Um, so I think this, you will see a significant change. Now you'll also see that fear mongering and you'll, you'll see it all come back again and you see it around, you know, Ilhan Omar already. And so I think it's, you're right to, to kind of plant a flag. Like uh, a lot of this stuff is going to get worse. I mean, I'll point to another thing, Tommy, like there was an Al Qaeda attack for the first successful Al Qaeda attack in American soil since nine 11, right? that killed American service members when a Saudi pilot and a U.S. government program killed people and it barely registered. It's well, if that, ha if that happens under Joe Biden, like all hell will break loose on the right. And so we just have to be mindful of that. But I hope that the Biden people reject it, I, you know, that they, they don't succumb as much as we did, frankly, to the fear of being called weak on terrorism in, in some of their policies. Because I think the Trump years proved that that's just bullshit, that they don't really... They don't really care about that. They didn't they didn't care when that terrorist attack happened and they killed U.S. service members because Trump happened to be president. It just shows you how much this industry of fear is 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 in service of a particular right wing political agenda. And unfortunately, the media goes along with it because fear gets clicks. Yeah, agreed. All right. Uh, let's turn to a country we don't talk about a lot on the show, which is Angola. Uh, so here's the story. So in 2017, uh, Jose Eduardo de Santos, who had served as president since 1979, stepped down and Jao Lorenzo took over. Lorenzo has made combating corruption central to his tenure in office, and his government is focused on prosecuting those who profited during the previous regime, including the former president's children. Uh, Isabel de Santos, uh, the president, former president's daughter, is the richest woman in Africa, Ben, worth approximately $1.5 billion and has been accused of embezzling millions of dollars from state-owned oil company that she was in charge of uh, and is in this protracted legal battle with a number of governments. So now the current president, uh, President Lorenzo, is estimating that the government lost $24 billion from corruption under de Santos's rule, double what Angola holds in foreign currency reserves. Uh, man, Ben, I don't know a ton about this backstory. I, I read this interview uh, the current president did with the Wall Street Journal where he estimated this figure and, and I think announced it for the first time. A anything like more you want to share about Angola generally or, or this corruption? And then, you know, we've talked a bunch of times uh, about the need for the U.S. to push back on kleptocracy and embezzlement and corruption like this. In that vein, like, what do you think the government, uh, the United States should do here? Well, I mean, first of all, it, it, Angola is an oil rich, fossil fuel rich uh, country. And so to me, it, it reinforces how 
much the connection between autocracy and oil leads to these kinds of circumstances, right? Because the, the, the national wealth is tied up in one industry that can be controlled by a corrupt leader who can siphon off just vast sums. Mm -hmm. And at some point in that chain of, of events, oil companies are playing along, people are playing along with this stuff, you know, like it doesn't just, you know, happen because someone's a master crook, you know, uh, it's how the system is kind of wired as long as, as the oil is flowing, like you, you pay who you need to pay. And I think the U.S. can do a lot more uh, on this. I mean, and uh, to read to plug another book, I just read Kleptopia, or I'm reading now. It's it, it it it's all about dark money and how it flows through the global economy, and the global economy depends a lot on the U.S. financial system. A lot of this money moves through dollars. Sometimes it's parked in shell companies in the U.S. You know, the, where people don't have to disclose who owns a company. There are specific policy changes that the U.S. can make to combat this kind of corruption. I mean, first of all, we can introduce transparency requirements for people who are you know, setting up companies in the United States or buying real estate in the United States, another place where people like to hide money so that we can track these flows more. And then I think we should make anti-corruption like central to our democracy agenda around the world, that, that the U.S. has a lot of tools to track illicit financial flows and to blow a whistle on it and to reveal corruption, right? Uh, we, you know, if we see something like this, we should say something, you know? Um, so I, I'd like to see corruption really be a, a focal point because, you know, it, it can completely screw people in an entire country like Angola, never mind how we've seen it in, in, in other places, in Hungary, for instance. Um, and and I, it, it leads to the erosion of, of democracy as well. And, and of course, inequality. So if you want to get at autocracy and inequality you got to get at corruption and and dark financial flows 24 billion dollars that is that's prodigious uh theft right there uh, a couple more quick ones so uh first an update on facebook so mark our friend mark zuckerberg two years after taking this the utterly absurd indefensible position that facebook shouldn't take down uh posts featuring holocaust denial because he claimed you couldn't divine uh the intent of the poster uh zuckerberg has reversed himself on monday he posted a, a blog update where he said his thinking had evolved because there has been uh, an increase in anti-Semitic violence. Zuckerberg also pointed to survey data that you and I talked about a few weeks ago on the show uh, about a disconcerting lack of awareness about the Holocaust, especially young among young people in America. Facebook also has recently decided to take down posts related to QAnon, uh, to militia groups. They've announced that they'll have a ban on political ads after Election Day and remove posts that call for poll watchers or other voter intimidation. So activists were, I guess, relatively happy about most of these announcements. And, you know, credit where credit's due. But, you know, they say the key is making sure that Facebook actually implements these policies. So, I, you know, I guess good for them for finally getting to a, a reasonable position. But it's so frustrating to think of all the damage that's been done over the past few years. I mean, again, Facebook pretends to have this sort of like laissez-faire, hands-off, free speech, absolutist approach to their content. But in reality, like there are strict rules on like what your ads can look like and their algorithm decides what you see and your willingness to, to pay money to boost posts gets it to more people. And so like this is not the case. So I should note that YouTube still refuses to ban QAnon content. Their CEO was quoted talking about this today, which is just like outrageous. I don't know, but what'd you make of this announcement? Uh, hopeful sign, or maybe this is just, you know, Facebook suddenly waking up to the fact that Democrats could be in power yeah, soon and exactly. concerned about regulation. Yeah. Bingo. I, you, 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 that's my take. I mean, first of all, I, I'm noting that according to Google, at least Mark Zuckerberg is worth $93 billion. Um, <laughs> so we, we laugh at the Angolan, but like we've got, uh, you know, this corrupt guy who's got a platform that is literally tearing apart our country and countries around the world. And he's worth $93 billion. And he says it's all about the inter open internet and the ethos of whatever libertarian ideology that underpins that, when in fact, it's about that $93 billion. I think you're right. Like, the, the regulation train is coming. Like, they see what we all see, which is that it looks like Joe Biden is more likely to win the election. Democrats could control Congress. And Democrats are intent on regulating these social media platforms. And, and these, uh, yeah, is it a positive step that they're taking Holocaust denial of Facebook? Of course it is. But like, that's not structural change. They need to change their algorithms. They need to change how they disseminate content. They need to change algorithms that, that hermetically seal people 
in echo chambers of their own ideological stew, even if that stew is like QAnon or some other crazy conspiracy theory, and then mainlines the most sensationalist content to people because it'll get more clicks because it pads their advertising revenue so that Mark Zuckerberg goes from being worth $93 billion to $100 billion. Like that, like, so like the, the problem I have with all these things is that they are treated as PR issues by Facebook and not as structural issues with their platform, you know? And, and until they address the structural issues with how their platform operates, these one-offs can make things incrementally better, but like they're, they're fundamentally just PR so that when the Democrats, if, if knock on wood, hope to God, Joe Biden can overcome Facebook disinformation to become elected president of the United States, that, that they then have some talking points to say, well, we, you know, we are, we're getting our house in order. No, no, their, their house is not in order. And, and, and it's going to take, as it has with every other major industry throughout history, it's going to take a degree of government regulation here to, to ensure that public safety is protected. Yep. Uh, quickly to Belarus. So protests in Belarus over the, the stolen election of President Alexander Lukashenko are now in their second month. And there are still hundreds of thousands of citizens continuing to protest in the streets. The, the protests themselves have been incredibly inspiring. The, these people are they're sick of corruption. They're sick of living under uh, a dictatorship. Unfortunately, the response from the government has been brutal and it may get worse. So we've talked before about reports of protesters being detained in mass or beaten or tortured. Then on Sunday, though, things escalated when the Interior Ministry announced that police will be allowed to use lethal force. Uh, the BBC reported that the European Union is prepared to expand sanctions against Belarusian officials to include the president himself. Putin is now saying he's ready to send in Russian police to help out if asked. So that is like a pretty dramatic escalation to me, like going from beating the shit out of people to announcing that you will just kill protesters. How do you think the international response needs to change to meet this, you know, pretty psychotic new announcement from the government? I mean, I think that the, the sanctions have to evolve to a place where it's essentially like that, that, that this Lukashenko is just not recognized as a legitimate leader of Belarus by Europe and the United States. You know, I mean, this is someone who is a European leader. Like the, the, this isn't like a regime change policy um, in some other part of the world. This is a guy who tried to steal an election is now trying to kill protesters in Europe. Right. And and so I think the EU, even though Belarus is obviously not a member, but like can have a much more forceful voice here. And they're moving in that direction. And that's good. And they should also do things like I saw Merkel meet with the leader of the, the opposition in Belarus. That's another piece of this is, is what are you doing to try to legitimize and speak to and, and engage in dialogue with the opposition here? And this could be a very unsettled time because let's say Biden wins the election. Like, I'm curious how many <coughs> creeps around the world are going to make their play in that transition period in November and December before mm -hmm. a normal, not that Joe Biden's going to ride in like on horseback and fix all these problems, but he's at least going to care about them. Right. And so I do worry that the timing of some of this stuff could accelerate if our election result goes in the right direction, because that, that will be perceived to be a window of time to get crackdowns done um, before you have a new American administration. Yeah. You, you Venmo Jared Kushner and uh, you're all good. Yeah. Uh, so, Pro-marijuana legalization activists in, in Mexico have developed a, a lobbying approach, Ben, that I think we all need to embrace and get behind. <laughs> yeah. It's from a great report in the LA Times. Uh, I'm a subscriber, by the way. Great paper. You should pay for yeah, it. Yeah, great again. paper. Great so paper. So for the past nine months, uh, pro-legalization activists in Mexico have set up a cannabis garden right near the Mexican Senate where they are growing weed and allowing people to smoke. Uh, the smell from the plants, the smoke... Uh, it's supposed to remind lawmakers that they have until December 15th of this year to pass laws regulating marijuana, which will quickly make Mexico the biggest legal cannabis market in the world. I'm curious if West Hollywood is number two. Uh, in 2018, the Mexican Supreme Court ruled that bans on marijuana were unconstitutional, but Congress has to write laws to regulate the, the recreational use. So the debate in Mexico is interesting. It's similar to the one in the U.S., who gets to grow it? Who gets to sell it? Who gets to make a profit? What about foreign companies? How hard or easy should it be for consumers to get? There's also the question of what it will mean for the drug cartels who may be worried about losing revenue. Uh, it will also have a huge impact on Mexico's criminal justice system. 
which like ours, uh, although yeah. they have way fewer people incarcerated. I think I read 200,000 people incarcerated. Uh, they still have lots in, in jail for stupid drug charges that are marijuana related. Uh, then assuming that there are reasonable restrictions put on consumption of marijuana by minors, do you see any downside to these legalization efforts? Like I'm trying to think if, uh, I'm trying to make sure that I'm not hopping on the train here just because it seems obvious to me, but I don't know. What, what do you make of this? I mean, it seems obvious to me, you know, yeah. I mean, in this country, right, it, it, um, it reduces incarceration dramatically. Uh, it allows for regulation. It raises tax revenue off of marijuana products and it makes very good marijuana products available. Um, Venice, basically where I live is like an open air version of that protest yeah. in Mexico city. If you walk outside, um, I think that the bigger question here is um, coordinated legalization in the Americas, right? Because a lot of the drug trade flows south to north, has huge impacts in Central American countries, on Colombia, up to the U.S. And, and you know, under the Obama administration, there was some pressure from uh, some Latin American leaders to, to legalize. I think there were concerns that if it was ad hoc and done in different ways in different countries, that that could put more pressure on the illegal drug trade in other countries, um, you know, as people are, as cartels are looking for markets. So uh, what I think needs to happen here is as the U.S. moves to decriminalize marijuana and as Mexico does, we need to look at this across the hemisphere, you know, um, so that there's kind of a coordinated view of how to use legalization to put cartels out of some business. There's obviously still going to be heroin and other drugs, cocaine that they're selling um, so that, you know, you, you don't have a circumstance where this is negatively impacting some countries and not you know, you know benefiting others. Um, I, I, you know, this could be an interesting agenda item if the Biden administration yeah. wins and wants to be ambitious for for a, a, a hemisphere wide initiative. Yeah, that's a very good idea. Uh, last thing, kind of a fun story out of Costa Rica. A team of scientists decided to create 3D printed fake turtle eggs to track a network of illegal poachers who have been stealing turtle eggs, many of them endangered, and then selling them for food. Here's the idea, basically. You, you, you create this fake egg, you put a GPS tracker inside of it, you hide it in the turtle nest. So when these, these creeps come along and they take the real eggs, they unknowingly collect a tracking device that can help you figure out where they're going, what they're doing with these, these endangered turtle eggs and sort of stop the, the process. Uh, very cool idea. The fake eggs are called investigators. Uh, ben, uh, Jordan, Jordan and Michael wanted me to ask you if you are on team bionic turtle egg or team mine rat from last week, you have to decide today. I think I'm gonna go bionic turtle egg. I mean, this is, cause I'm trying to imagine the meeting where somebody came up with this. I mean, that's a good meeting to be good in, meeting. you know, that's a cool meeting. Yeah. Like who are the, you know, like the, 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 the uh, and you know what, it might be tied to marijuana legalization, you know? Um, I mean, somebody might, you know, been sitting around watching the wire, uh, like popping an edible and yeah. thinking to myself, you know, Jordan claims it's hey. based on the wire and, and breaking bad. I I'm, I'm wondering, you know, people probably had heard of like GPS before that, but you know, I like, I like the inspiration. I like the inspiration. I, I like the inspiration and, and, and I like the idea of using animals to get revenge on bad human beings, given how <laughs> poorly human beings have treated animals. So I'm, I'm totally on board with the project. Also, if you have really cool rats and you have really cool turtle eggs, you basically have Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We just sort of we just rewrote the movie. I mean, there is a movie in this or, 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 or a Netflix series where each episode is like some animal sting, you know. Um, yeah. Ben, thank you. Thanks to all the uh, heroic mine rats and or uh, fake turtle eggs out there. And, uh, you know, 21 days, people. Vote Save America. 21 days, people. Let's do it. Let's go. Let's go win this thing.